improvements in the understanding and treatment of MS are providing hope for patients living with the disease. Dr. Scott Newsom reviews the immune system and the role it plays in the advancement of disease treatment. Hello, my name is Dr. Scott Newsom. I'm a neurologist at the Johns Hopkins MS Center and Transverse Myelitis Center. Thank you for listening today. You may be asking yourself, why is a neurologist talking about the immune system? Aren't neurologists really supposed to just focus on the brain, the spine, the eyes, maybe the muscles? What we've learned, at least in multiple sclerosis, is that the immune system plays an integral role in the pathogenesis of this condition. Now, if we go back into the early 1800s, 1900s, MS was thought to be uh, related to maybe a lack of sweat, poor circulation, toxic exposures, and I think we've come a long way from then. And now we are getting a better sense of how the immune system is integral in causing this disease, or at least in part uh, causing. The primary etiology of multiple sclerosis is not known. However, most people feel that it's a multitude of factors that play into the development of multiple sclerosis. And at the center of the stage or the center of the show is the immune system. Now, the immune system itself is uh, comprised of really two uh, arms, the innate immune system, which we're learning more about, uh, and then the adaptive immune system, which is comprised of B cells and T cells. And why it's extremely important for us all to have a basic understanding of immunology and these different immune systems is because of the therapies we have available today. These disease-modifying therapies that we have that have proven in clinical trials to help cut back relapses, to cut back new spots on MRI, which can translate into preventing disability over time. So why is it important to have a basic understanding of the immune system for all of us? It really comes down to the expanding armamentarium of treatments that we have in multiple sclerosis. The therapies called disease-modifying therapies affect and modulate different aspects of the immune system. So when, you know, we're talking to patients and loved ones or talking to colleagues about these therapies, it's nice to really be able to share with them, okay, you have this particular medication, how does it affect the immune system? And by affecting the immune system, what is that going to do for the individual? And we know in clinical trials, at least for the current approved therapies, they have all proven to be effective. Now, some seem to be more effective than others uh, in terms of cutting back relapses, new MRI lesions, and disability, but they have all shown to be effective in treating multiple sclerosis. Also, I'm a big believer that if you have a basic understanding of the immune system and how it works for a particular disease, and then you have a treatment or treatments that are affecting the immune system, you'll have a better understanding not only of the good of the therapy, but also the not so good, the side effects that can come from these medications. So it really gives you a window into how these uh, therapies uh, can be good and also bad. Now, when we think about the specific immune cells that are playing a role in causing multiple sclerosis, you know, I, I usually like to take the 50,000-foot view to give a, a good uh, understanding and broad, you know, uh, strokes. And so the immune system, as all of you know, is extremely important to keep us healthy. So if someone gets an infection, if they're, ex you know, exposed to a bacteria or a virus, the immune system is supposed to rev up. It's like the first responder, second responders within military uh, forces they go to fight the bad guys, the infections. In autoimmune diseases, what ends up happening is these immune cells that are supposed to protect us, they get tricked into thinking that parts of our body are actually the enemy. And these what are called antigens, which are presented to immune cells that activate them, some of these antigens look like parts of our body, including like myelin proteins, neuronal proteins, and so when these antigens are presented, let's say, to a T cell, 
to say, hey, T cell, let's get activated. Let's go fight this, this infection, this bacteria. They mistaken the nervous system in MS, myelin, axons, the hardwiring of the nervous system as the enemy. And so the cells in the periphery, in the blood, get activated. Then they cross over the blood-brain barrier. There's another sort of cross-communication with other immune cells, in part the innate immune system uh, on the blood, over on the blood-brain uh, barrier side. And they get reactivated, and they launch this huge attack on the axons, you know, the myelin, uh, even neurons. And the immune cells, including B cells and T cells, are a big perpetrator of, of the disease pathogenesis in MS. I mentioned the innate immune system before, which we're starting to understand more about the innate immune system and the implications of them actually becoming angry uh, during the disease process, including microglia and macrophages. Now, we still have a lot more to learn about the innate immune system and its impact in MS. Um, and hopefully in the future, and I know this for certain, that there are therapeutics that are being developed to now target some of these innate immune cells. And I mentioned before that uh, the adaptive immune system is where most of our therapies currently target. Uh, and we have medications that are more than two decades old that have proven again and again that they help improve the way the immune system is behaving. And I'm a big believer that uh, over the last 20 or so years, and even more recently, with the advent of these high-efficacy medications that we have, that we're really changing the outcome for people with MS. And we're really keeping people you know, functioning at a higher level than once before with these therapies. Um, you know, we focus a lot on the therapies, the treatments, the medications, but I would also say that what's complementary to these therapies and what we do in our clinic is we support non-medication interventions as well, including healthy lifestyle, uh, because what we've learned over the years is that, you know, if someone's a chronic smoker, or has a poor diet, this also makes the immune system not happy and makes it angry. And there's a bunch of studies that have shown now that if someone has an unhealthy lifestyle, including smoking chronically, that that actually increases one's risk to not only develop MS, but if they have MS, that it will make MS more aggressive and more angry. So we really try to look at treating the person from a holistic perspective um, so we take the medications that have been proven in clinical trials and bring that together with healthy lifestyle, exercise in moderation. All of this is part of the treatment of multiple sclerosis. And what's really exciting is that there are a number of very interesting uh, pipeline medications that over the next few years will likely be approved for use in multiple sclerosis that target different regions of the immune system uh, maybe a little more eloquently than what we have today. And also, even more exciting, I think for many people, are that we are on the horizon of medications that actually can repair the damage that's been done. So we have good medications now that can prevent new things from happening in MS, including relapses, MRI activity, the problem, though, is when someone comes to us and already has disability, it's great to get them on a medication so we can prevent new things from happening, but what about the damage that was left behind before someone gets on a therapy? So now we're entering into a realm where we're going to have therapies that may have the potential to repair some of that damage. So not only prevention, but also improving functionality, which I'm really excited about. And, um, you know, in years past, even when I started my career in multiple sclerosis and neurology, we just had a small handful of therapies. And now, fast forward, you know, over a decade, we're at the brink of having therapies that, you know, short of a cure, are actually going to put, improve uh, the functionality and well-being of people.